So there were people opposed to what the CE5 contact program was from the very, very earliest days. Most people don't realize that. On the other hand, there's a senior official at the CIA who flew down on a jet to my town in North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina, to say, do it and don't give up. Someone's got to do this because it's completely out of control and moreover, someone's going to have to spearhead not only making contact but informing the public because the system is so completely dysfunctional. Now the person who was sent down was a man whose family founded the California Institute of Technology, the most prestigious, one of the most prestigious universities in America, and is associated with the NSA and CIA. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm a country doctor in North Carolina rambling around in an ER, and uh, you know, I'm doing this sort of as just an ad hoc group to, to do this. He says, no, well, it, w someone is going to have to do this. Uh, but also is going to have to educate the public. And I said, well, I'll do what I can in between ER shifts and raising four children. And uh, as things went, you know, that was sort of the initiation and, and my, my initiation into this sort of weird, down the rabbit hole world of secret projects. I'm going, why is this guy coming as an emissary of this very senior CIA person who's involved in this, begging me to do something, why don't they just do it? Anyway, so you're going to see this leitmotif repeated over and over again over the course of today. Um, and at that point I said, okay, well I will do what I can. And a few months later uh, there was a man named uh, Bill Clinton got elected to the presidency of the United States and I was immediately approached by people who were friends of his and uh, who said, well, you know, this is something that he's very interested in and it's well known that uh, his good friend Webster Hubble, who was uh, third in command at uh, Justice Department prior to being convicted of some other problems, uh, said that the Bill Clinton asked when he, that he wanted to know about two things. Who really killed Marilyn Monroe? Because <laughs> he had a fascination with Marilyn Monroe. And who killed Jack Kennedy? And also, what is this UFO stuff? Is there anything really to it? So he made a directed inquiry, and as Webster Hubble reported in his book, Friends in High Places, this is not, you can take, read it and see, they made inquiries into the subject and they, quote, were not happy with the answers they were getting, which is a polite way of saying they know they were being lied to. Well, at that, about that time, and a little bit before some of the Clinton folks approached me, some military people who were friendly to disclosure approached me, who had had experiences either on battleships or at strategic uh, air command facilities where nuclear facilities are, made, are, are, are posted, and said, you know, I'll do anything I can to help you. And one of these men was a naval commander who was very connected up. Um, in the Pentagon, and he showed up at my door, basically, in, at, at my home, and I thought initially he was a spook, uh, a spy. And I said, well, this spook is probably here to disrupt my project. And it turns out he was a totally stand-up guy who did everything he could to set up a number of the meetings you're going to hear about behind the scenes in deep background briefings that I did at the Pentagon um, subsequently. And we decided to have a meeting. I was invited by a former State Department person to have a meeting at, at the Monroe Institute, um, which is ironically about 10 minutes from where my country home is now in Virginia, to discuss how to put together a team of people to brief um, the correct folks in government and encourage them to end the secrecy. Now, you have to understand this is 1992-93, 22 years ago, 21 years ago. I was in my 30s, um, a bit naive about how government worked. I actually thought we had a functional constitutional government. Um, I have since learned we do not, um, that that's all 
window dressing. That's all the Truman Show, like the movie The Truman Show, where it's all sort of a fake. Um, and that there's a parallel governmental process that runs this and other important issues that are completely out of the reach of the people we elect and appoint. But at that time, so we had this meeting, and it was decided that we should contact certain key people in the U.S. government to, in military speak, de-conflict the C-SETI contact teams from Air Force and other military operations so that they didn't interfere with us and we didn't interfere with them. That was the purpose of it, was to de-conflict that because we didn't want interference from those guys with what we were doing, which we were getting a lot of interference. We were getting helicopters, jets, all kinds of stuff coming in to our contact sites, and we still do to this day, which have been filmed and documented. So, unfortunately, we, <laughs> we said this is something that is really critical if we're going to make contact and not have it become something where something terrible happens accidentally. Okay, so my military advisor, who came forward said, let's see what I can do and run this up the flagpole, as they say. Um, and so he, uh, he knew the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, an admiral, who, um, Admiral um, Kramer with a C, C-R-A-M-E-R. -E and he uh, went in, had a meeting and said, look, we really need to have a meeting with the Air Force Intel people at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to which the Roswell remains were sent and which still had what was called the National Air Intelligence Center, and then it became the Foreign uh, Aerospace Technology Center. Uh, it was always FTD, a Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force back in the 40s and 50s. It's gone through many name changes. It's the same facility at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And he said, okay, let's, uh, let's see if you can set up a meeting. And the Admiral, now this is the head of Intelligence Joint Chiefs of Staff, pushed back from the desk and said, are you serious about UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence? And the, the commander, military commander, who was volunteering to help us said, yes, we're very serious. And so the admiral said, okay, I'll do it. So they refused to take the meeting. Now, so what happened is that J2, it's called J2, head of intelligence joint staff, called the head of Air Force Intelligence and said, you will make this meeting happen and Dr. Greer will be received there because they have something to discuss with those folks. And that was now the fall, September 1993. Okay, so it that sit meeting was set up. Now in the meanwhile, some folks working with Boutros Boutros Ghali, the UN Secretary General at the time, and Lawrence Rockefeller, who was the um, scion of the Rockefeller uh, family, who was the philosopher king of the family. I mean, David Rockefeller was sort of the money guy with Chase Manhattan, which became J.P. Morgan Chase. And uh, his nephew, J. Rockefeller, was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And um, Nelson Rockefeller, who had passed away, who had been vice president, ironically, was his brother who had set up the Rockefeller Commission of 1956 that completely reorganized the Department of Defense and the CIA so no U.S. president could contain or control or penetrate UFO projects. So the Rockefeller family up to their eyeballs in this. Lawrence knew that, but he was on the side of the angels. He wanted to sort of cleanse the karma, as it were, I believe, uh, of that family and actually help. So a lot of people have, of course, attacked me for knowing a Rockefeller uh, as proof that I'm sort of part of some cabal. I said, no, they contacted me because he, Lawrence, knew that what we were doing was really novel and was effective because he had sent people, it turned out, to some of our events where we had had contact, where we did the CE5 protocols and ET craft would appear and then disappear. And he went, holy, they went, he took this information back to Lawrence and said, this is no joke. So Lawrence Rockefeller, invited me up to New York and then invited me to his ranch, the JY Ranch in uh, Wyoming. And as you know, uh, that's where the Clintons for the first couple years of their presidency would vacation in August. But I was asked to go there um, in September of 1993 to uh, basically 
share what he thought would just be the information about the CE5 initiative. Lawrence did not, Lawrence Rockefeller did not know about the initiative to brief senior governmental officials and encourage them to end the secrecy, which had started a few months prior to that at this meeting in Virginia uh, at the Monroe Institute with a select number of folks that my military advisors had gathered together um, in, that was July of 93. So the, he just thought it was going to be a discussion about the protocols of the CE5 initiative, re remote viewing, making contact, interstellar di diplomacy, all of these concepts. And so we decided that it was really time for us to go ahead uh, and have some meetings like this with, with Lawrence. Uh, and I said, OK, I'll go. Uh, because I have to go out, I'm on a trip anyway, taking time off from my medical work in the ER to uh, go to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which also Lawrence knew nothing about. Lawrence Rockefeller knew nothing about. So here's what happened. I was going to, uh, I was going to go to the, uh, uh, the Rockefeller Ranch just as sort of a, a guest to, to share this, and, and during the course of a sort of a round table, and there were all kinds of people there. Uh, Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Aerospace, who's a billionaire, uh, was there, a whole bunch of people who of various backgrounds in the UFO subculture, some friendly to what we do and some incredibly unfriendly, who we found out were working for the intelligence community, were there. And there was this gathering at this famous Rockefeller Ranch in the, the Grand Tetons. Um, so one day it came up what else I was working on. I said, well, we've initiated a project to brief senior government officials in the Clinton administration and the Pentagon and members of Congress so that we can terminate secrecy on this issue and get the government to change policy because we understand that the incoming president is favorable to that idea, which was, of course, Bill Clinton. Um, and as a result, you could have heard a pin drop in the room. Nobody knew at all. And, and the first thing <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence Rockefeller said, what, who, what, it was like this. What, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going straight to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base after this meeting to brief the colonel over this foreign technology division of the Air Force. And then I'm going to, um, in a couple months, brief President Clinton's CIA director. So at this point, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller and everyone there was, were in a state of, of shock. Now, that initiated what has been incorrectly called the Rockefeller Initiative. There was no Rockefeller Initiative. Let me explain that in a moment. <laughs> what it was was an initiative because he found out what we were doing and his people said, you've got to get involved with this. So Lawrence wanted to play a behind-the-scenes role. And that's why he was willing to host the president and first lady at the ranch to provide what we put together, which was called the best available evidence, um, which is the collection of best cases, best photos, best government documents we had that were extant at that time in 1993. So the president and uh, was invited out in the following summers, two summers, to the Rockefeller Ranch for that purpose. Um, and the UN Secretary General in the meanwhile and his wife came to some meetings in what are called salons. A salon is when someone hosts a very nice meeting in a private home with dignitaries and you have a guest, usually some surprise guest or some interesting character like me to come in and inform the sort of the New York 100 about what's going on. So that's what I did. And they were incredibly successful. Subsequent to that, um, Mrs. Abutrascali invited us to have a, a meeting um, at the UN so I could brief a lot of the diplomats and friends of hers in the UN who were, who were supportive of ending secrecy and making peaceful interplanetary contact. And actually, Leah Ghali herself hosted that for me at the United Nations. Um, 
I'm just trying to give you sort of a sense of what happened before May of 2001 with the what's now very famous National Press Club event. So this was all going on with the idea that if we were to provide the correct information to the president and to his advisors and to members of Congress, to key people in Congress, they would do the right thing and would disclose this information because the Cold War had ended and we thought here's a fig leaf to put on the secrecy, even though it's a bit of a misdirect, but politicians always need to have a cover, a CYA. Washington's all about cover your ass. So to explain 40 years of secrecy, they could have said, well, during the Cold War tensions, we didn't want to throw into that mix the fact that we're being visited by interstellar civilizations and with also a, a program to study what their technologies are. And now that the Cold War is over, we can come clean. So I was recommending that they use that as an excuse for the chicanery that had gone on between 1956 and 1990s, 40 years. Well, it was an interesting thing that happened. In the fall of 1993, I was given a lecture at the, at the Colorado State University hosted by astronaut Brian O'Leary and Maury Albertson, who was one of the co-founders of the Peace Corps. And they became very, very close friends and supporters of what we were doing. Um, and in that presentation, I laid out the entire sort of manifesto of justifying disclosure, ending secrecy, and what we should do. And at the end of that talk, and I don't know, there were maybe 800 people there, 1,000, something like that. There was a man, a little bald man, standing at the back of the room. And he wouldn't leave, and he waited till almost everyone was gone. He came up to me and he said, Dr. Greer, um, I think I can help you with this. Um, I know some folks in Washington who want to know about this, but they're not getting any good answers. I said, well, like who? And I thought he was going to say, you know, staffers for Congressman blah, blah from Nowhereville, Montana. And he said, well, I'm very good friends with the director of Central Intelligence, the CIA director, and he would like to be briefed on this. And of course, I said, well, that's a good start. <laughs> so. And initially that meeting was set up for November of 1993 and it got pushed back because of scheduling conflicts that he had and I had um, to December 13th, 1993. My wife, Emily, was there with me um, and the cover story was a dinner party just here in Arlington at this man's home and with the CI director and with his, uh, the CI director's wife uh, Dr. Sue Woolsey, who was the Chief Operating Officer of the National Academy of Sciences. So, which is very good, because I feel well, we can get two birds with one stone here, because she's a very senior scientist in, in a very prestigious institution. Um, so, again, we got a nanny for the kids, flew up to Washington, had this meeting. Now, I, you know, normally when you meet with someone at cabinet level, it's a, you know, very tight, maybe 20 minutes, 15, 30. This went on for about three hours. And the initial part of it, I had this whole briefcase and portfolio full of all these images of photographs and documents and cases and all this stuff. And after about 10 minutes, uh, the CIA director said, OK, I know this. We're, we, we know that they exist. And it turns out he and his wife had had a sighting in New Hampshire when they were younger. I want to know, and this is the key question to answer, why won't they tell me and the president about it? I'm the CIA director. I said, ah, well, that's another discussion. And at first, you know, I got some hint of this when I got the letter, which I have in my archives, because subsequently, Woolsey tried to backpedal and say this briefing never happened. He publicly said so, and I can prove it to be a lie. I always say in Washington, how do you know they're lying? Their lips are moving. Lips are moving, that means they're lying. So, um, ouch. Did I just say that? Yeah, I did. It's on the record. There you go. So, uh, but the letter I got describing the briefing from our host said, 
that you're going to be the first person to brief the president's people and his CIA director on this issue because they've asked questions and they can't get anything through channels. Now, at that point, I have to say, I thought I was being Zoomed. <laughs> I really thought this was a prevarication and that, they, that this spy master, the CIA director, just wanted to pick my brain, find out what we were doing with folks like the Rockefellers and da-da-da. And it turned out he 100% was out of the loop. He knew nothing about these projects, and he was being completely deceived by those who had compartmented intelligence within the agency, the CIA, and he literally was, he was the emperor that had no clothes, and so was the president. So it was at that point, on December 13th, 1993, that I realized that we were living in a country that had undergone a quiet coup d'etat decades earlier that isn't talked about in the New York Times and Washington Post because it would be the biggest story ever and the biggest scandal ever. They'd rather talk about the blue stain on a dress and other trivialities or the stain on a blue dress and rather than talking about the truth. And we, at that point, uh, had put together a white paper, which is in my first book um, about extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, which you can get on our website at seriousdisclosure.com. And it describes basically the plan of what needed to be done by the chief executive, the president and his people, to end the secrecy. So I had that in my hands, and I was giving it to, to, to the CIA director as he was leaving. And um, he looked at me and he said, how can we disclose that which we have no access to? Very chilling question. So, in other words, <laughs> if we were to push on this, then it would unveil the biggest constitutional crisis in the United States history. And no president wants to admit that they're out of the loop on important things. No one wants to admit that. Therefore, he said, we will do what we can do. I'll continue to look into this. Please continue to send any information you have to me through this contact. But um, we'll have to see what the president can do.